All right. So, um, actually, for those of you who know Tracy Ralstead, Tracy is in Texas A&M right now. He's teaching a cyber class with Kate Davis on a power grid cyber class. And Tracy was in Texas A&M last week teaching a class with me. Uh, we gave a like intro to power world, in, intro to power system modeling, intro to power world, and intro to using power world for GMD and EMP analysis to the U.S. Defense Threat Reduction Agency. And we did it in three days. And it was like an impossible task because we were trying to teach power systems, power world, and uh, EMP and GMD to a, a bunch of people that really didn't know, were very smart people and are going to be using Power World a lot, but they didn't really know much about power systems. Um, the talk here is, of course, different because the assumption here was that you would know something, I mean, probably uh, most of you know a lot about power system modeling. So the initial talk is going to be kind of like a, a basic overview of modeling and then getting into dynamics. Uh, it should be review for just about everyone, but I wanted to kind of like set the stage and then Jamie's going to get into doing the um, modeling of the machines. This course came out of a short course that we gave at Texas A&M last September that Tracy, Jamie, and I taught in and it was a little different than the course that we gave here earlier because the, cave, the course that we had given here earlier on, on power system modeling and transient stability was more focused on um, you know, how do you add a plot and things like that. And we've got some of that in here but we also get into some of the theory. So Jimmy thinks of this course as more of a theory course. Um, it came out of a course that I taught at the university a number of times at the graduate level. Uh, on power system dynamics, which I think of as more of an applied course, because you could take this much more theoretically, but uh, we're trying to balance some theory with some applied. Okay, so this first talk is on the electric grid models and simulation. Um, you know, what, what do you say for a definition of modeling and simulation, and I, I just was Googling around, I found one is to say it's the use of the physical or logical representation of a given system to generate data and help determine decisions to make predictions about the system. And that's ultimately what we're doing. We're trying to make predictions about the electric grid. Uh, with electric grids, uh, we really I mean, we can test them a little bit, but we really can't test them a lot. So we kind of have to uh, simulate them. So most of what we get is based on uh, simulation here. One of the um, uh, quotes that I like uh, is, all models are wrong, but some are useful. That's from George Box, who was a professor of statistics at my alma mater, University of Wisconsin-Madison. I don't know where I got that from. I might have got it from Don Watkins at BPA. Uh, I might have got it from Jeff Daigle. Jeff Daigle, I was just at a modeling, a, a National Academy's modeling uh, workshop, and Jeff said that same quote. And I don't know if George Box was the first one to say it. I mean, it's something that we all kind of intuitively know, uh, but it's good to, uh, you know, bring it to mind because we're simulating the grid and we're using models to simulate the grid and we try to have good models, but they're all going to be wrong at some point. And the challenge as engineers is to know uh, what Box went on to say is to know the practical question, how wrong do they have to be to not be useful? And, you know, as we simulate the grid in a static sense or in a dynamic sense, a static, at least you can kind of see the grid operating. Uh, in a dynamic sense, you get the grid stressed because you have events on the grid and they perturb the uh, grid and you can learn from those perturbations to the grid, but you don't really know how the grid's going to respond to a really bad perturbation uh, until something occurs, like the August 14, 2003 blackout. So a good part of engineering is deciding what is the appropriate level of modeling to do. And this is something that we struggle with uh, all the time in the power areas and to know under what conditions our models uh, fail. And of course, always keep in mind what problem we're trying to solve. 
Uh, I like to start out with dynamics with this example. I like it and, and I don't like it. It's, of course, the, um, the oscillations that you guys had out here in 1996. I like it because it shows how the models were wrong. I don't like it because people often will put up the slide and make it appear as though we haven't done anything in the last 25 years. It's like the models in 1996 did not represent those oscillations, but a lot of work has gone on in the last 24 years or so uh, to hopefully get better models. And, you know, part of what you do to get better models is you look at how the system responds during disturbances. Uh, this is from the blackout report of August 14, 2003. And that was a slowly evolving, mostly static event. Uh, I got uh, a chance to be part of the investigation team and uh, my team, which was two people, myself and Doug Wiegman, uh, went to First Energy right after the blackout occurred. It occurred on a Thursday and we were there on a Tuesday afterwards talking to everyone who was in the control center uh, to see what they did. And it played out over more than an hour. And that was interesting. But at the end, it, it was very much a dynamic phenomenon at the end as the grid was starting to break up and starting to oscillate. Uh, so you do get oscillations under these stress conditions. Uh, this is a third example um, from the blackout that occurred on September 8th, 2011. Uh, much more up-to-date models, but the issue here is the simulation tool still missed seeing what would actually occurred during that event. Uh, that affected, uh, of course, Southern California and part of Arizona, part of Mexico. Might be hard to see the time scale, or I mean the uh, y-axis there, but the y-axis is hertz and goes from 61 at the top down to 53 at the bottom. So there was quite a variation in frequency during that event. Okay, so Here's the basics, which I think everybody knows, and uh, luckily I'll be able to go through it uh, pretty fast. Of course, the electric grid has generation, load, and transmission. Uh, that's a cartoon view of the grid, and we all know how the grid is put together. Uh, it's certainly uh, it, it, it's a cartoon view, and it, and it is changing, because of course now we're getting much more distributed generation in the load and we're having to deal with this. When this cartoon was put together, there wasn't all that uh, generation in the load. And that's <coughs> changing and we're having to deal with that. Um, we of course operate synchronous electric grids. Uh, much of the electricity in, in the world is supplied at 60 or 50 hertz. Uh, of course you can't transfer power between grids that are operating at the same frequency but are not in synchronism unless you take it from you know AC to DC to AC and in the US or North America that's what we have um, of course we're here in the West we're actually doing a study right now where we're looking at joining the West and the East to see what would be the dynamic ramifications of doing that. Uh, we're using Power World to do that. One of the good things about using Power World is in the West, the modeling format comes out of PSLF and Power World supports the PSLF models and the East has got PSSE models and Power World supports the PSSE models so we can combine the two and we're just starting to do these studies looking at what will occur. So oh, putting DC. No, AC. AC. Yeah. Um, we're combining the grids. We're putting together AC. This is, this is in grid. This is in grid. Yeah, me and uh, I mean the. <laughs> yeah, me and not Power World. Me and and uh, staff engineer and, and grad students. And throughout any questions, you know, feel free to ask questions throughout. But we'll see how that works. I did some preliminary studies and it didn't look as bad as I thought it was going to be. So a challenge in doing this study is to say what would be the worst case conditions why we wouldn't want to do that. 
not not talking about politically doing it. And I will say we are not putting ERCOT in there because ERCOT is separate because of a political issue, not because of anything else. What do they use for modeling? Who ERCOT? Yeah, mostly the SSE. Yeah, they they like <laughs> user-defined models. Um, we like the West because there's not user software, <laughs> so the West is more fun. But yeah, ERCOT uses a lot of user-defined models. What I what I found was interesting is I moved from you know Champaign up there down to College Station, Texas, and I live in Brazos County, mm -hmm. and I think of myself as living deep in the heart of Texas. But the Eastern Interconnect actually comes into our county. If I had lived just like a mile further. I think southeast I would have been getting my power from the Eastern Interconnect. So uh, Texas is of course covered by the three grids. Okay, so of course three phase systems, uh, you know, um, we tend to think of the grid as being balanced and most of our analysis is done assuming a balanced grid and that's certainly what Power World Simulator does primarily is we use a positive sequence representation of the grid. Uh, that's a picture of a, a substation bus. Uh, I'm, you know, it's like you guys don't have to go far to see a substation bus. <laughs> uh, this is a, a graph that I, I like to show in explaining the challenges in modeling power systems. Um, you know, power systems exist on so many different time scales. And you can do studies looking at lightning propagation where you need to use a tool like uh, the EMTP analysis to get the very fast transients in the grid, uh, the switching surges. Uh, where we're dealing with right now are how do we handle inverter-based controls and if we add them into a, a dynamics package like Power World Simulator, how do we do that effectively? And we're actually working on a project uh, with uh, we being Texas A&M and uh, Sandia and Power, and Power World, I think Montana Tech, in adding in saying how do we modify the dynamic models to include uh, some of these faster transients in there. Uh, primarily what we'll be talking about today is in this time frame going from perhaps cycles out to tens of seconds kind of what we, the power world calls it transient stability. I kind of wish I had named it dynamics when we created it, because it's, it's not just transient stability. It can do longer term dynamics as well. And we're actually doing longer term simulations where we'll run these dynamic models, uh, including the WCC model, where we'll run it out for many long, long time periods. And sometimes the models work for that and sometimes they don't. And of course, as you get further out, you get into voltage stability, power flow, and a unit commitment. Uh, before we get further in, it's, it's important to differentiate between the model and the model's parameters. Uh, the models approximate the generic behavior of an object. Uh, for example, you could think about a model for a resistor. A model for a resistor says that uh, the voltage is equal to the resistance times the current. So the that's the model. Then you take a particular resistor and you say, oh, it's got an ohm value of 10 ohms. That's the parameter associated with it. Uh, the models and the parameters can be tightly coupled. And um, the parameters for a particular model might have been derived from actual results of a test. And a lot of times those parameters are tuned to the model. Okay, so you might go out and you test a generator and then you tune it to a, a Gen R U model or a Gen TP um, a J model or something like that. And if that model is wrong, then if you discover that and you decide to use a better model, you kind of have to retune it because you just can't transfer the parameters from one model to another. And to go with the resistor example, um, the resistance of aluminum conductor is dependent on temperature and frequency. So a simple model there that says V is equal to Ri for that resistor might get more complicated when you think, oh, um, 
maybe the frequency varies, which it does with harmonics, and that affects things, and maybe the temperature varies. Uh, this is uh, the graphic there is kind of one of the more interesting things that we did with the August 14, 2003 blackout data. We, we took the line flows <coughs> on, on both ends of a, of a line, and from that we could estimate what the power loss on the line was. Okay, and because we had the voltage and the P and the Q, we knew what the current on the line was. And from that, we could estimate the resistance of the line. And then we plotted that resistance here as a function of time. And what we found is that the resistance on that line went up right at the end by about 50%. And that actually corresponded to about a 100 degree C rise in the surface or the temperature of that line. This was the... Um, Sam Star line is a 345 kV line that when it went out of service on August 14, 2003, it kind of uh, did in the, that was like a major step in, in the blackout. Okay, so there's an example where the resistance is changing with temperature. Uh, we're doing geomagnetic disturbance analysis, and in geomagnetic disturbance analysis, uh, there you are just concerned with the resistance. And resistance varies by, I think it's 0.6% per degree C. So normally when you do a power flow, the, re the resistance is changing with temperature, but it's not the major impact on your flows, because your flows are much more dominated by the reactance of the lines. But when you get into geomagnetic disturbance analysis, you just have a resistive network considering temperature might be something that we need to look at. So um, we can't get too accurate when you really have parameters that are so varying with temperature. Okay, in um, doing the uh, class today, we need to differentiate between static and dynamic analysis. Uh, this appears in many fields. If you're just familiar with power flow analysis, in power flow analysis, you're primarily looking at what are the characteristics of an equilibrium point for a power system. Um, a real power system is always changing. Okay, so if you go into your control center and you look at the flows on your system, you can do an online, you know, you can get the state estimation and then do a power flow and that gives you a snapshot for the system and it's pretty good. You can run real-time contingency analysis on it, but you come back 10 minutes later and it's going to be changed. Okay. But in a, a, what we call the quasi-steady state time period, you think of the system as being at an equilibrium point. And static analysis looks at characteristics of that equilibrium point. Um, dynamic analysis is going to be looking at perturbations away from that equilibrium point. So what we're going to be talking about primarily in this class is the dynamic analysis, that is how does the system change over time when it's kicked away from the equilibrium point. And usually in a power system dynamics we want to know is the system going to return to some good equilibrium point. And that's a combination of, you know, the characteristics of the system and the characteristics of its protection system. Because the system will return to some equilibrium point. It just not, might not be a good equilibrium point. Um, so the key analysis question, setting up and solving the models, uh, we need to know the time frame of interest. And this is something that in, in setting up things like you know, the generator models that Jamie's going to talk about, the load models, you have to look and say, what, what is your time frame of interest here? In dynamics, it's primarily going to be cycles out to tens of seconds. Okay, so when you look at that, then you can make assumptions as to what change is so slow that we don't have to represent it. And in dynamics, we have usually not included models for the tap changers out there because the assumption is in a 30-second or 20-second dynamic study, the 
caps aren't going to change. But they could change. And if you go longer than that, then you have to uh, put the taps in there. Uh, in the power flow, usually we run with uh, constant real and reactive power models, which is saying they don't depend on the voltage. And that's valid over a longer, the quasi-steady state time frame. You can say, yeah, the, the power really doesn't change much with voltage in the power flow time frame. And that's why in most power flow applications, you can get by with a, with a constant power model. Of course, that doesn't work in dynamics, where in dynamics, you're going to have to uh, include some voltage dependence in the load and increasingly we're having more and more dynamics in the load. So um, on the other hand, values that change quickly relative to the time frame of interest can be assumed to be algebraic. So if you're saying something is changing so fast relative to my time frame of interest, I'll just make it an algebraic constraint. And that's why in the power flow, we have this concept of a PV bus. You know, PV bus is saying the generator is going to hold this voltage terminal at, or voltage magnitude at some constant value. And that's fine in a power flow. In uh, transient stability and dynamics, we're going to get rid of that assumption and we say, look, the generator's got an exciter there and we have to look at the dynamics of the exciter. So we'll be talking about the dynamics of the exciter, talking about dynamics of the stabilizers. Um, both power flow and transient stability <coughs> make the assumption that the network power balance equations are assumed to be algebraic constraints. Okay, so we represent in power flow and in dynamics, we represent the transmission system as a uh, and set of algebraic constraints, which says an impact here instantaneously goes across the whole grid. So how fast does lightning propagate, or how fast does light propagate? 186,000 miles per second. Yeah, 186,000 miles per second. Um, so we'll use miles. Uh, that's good. Uh, 300,000 kilometers. Yeah, 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 300 <laughs> kilometers. So, in a millisecond, it goes 186 miles. How big is WCC? Bigger than that, 1,000 miles. Yeah, so if you had to go from Alberta down to, let, let's say it's, it's 1,860 miles. So that means to go from the north to the south is 10 milliseconds. Okay. And when you run transient stability, what time step do you run at? Quarter cycle. Yeah. It's ordained in the West that you use a quarter cycle, which is about four milliseconds. So our assumption here of it being algebraic is breaking down. Because when I solve those network equations, I'm assuming they're algebraic. An algebraic equation says everything propagates instantaneously through the system. And that's starting to break down. It's just on the verge of breaking down. Um, you know, when we when we look at coupling the east and the west, we're going to be talking about how far is how wide is the U.S. Like three thousand miles. So I mean, it, it gets a little bit wider. Uh, we're we're not going to get rid of that assumption because it's just so baked in. But you do need to understand it's right on the verge of of not being valid. Um, and then also in, in any of these, you need to incorporate the human response uh, in the power flow, the control response of the human operator is considered to be a fast control, whereas in dynamic analysis, it's either slow or needs to be considered. Um, you know, when, when we solve a power flow and you solve a power flow and all these taps change around and all these switch shunts change around, how much of that is really automatic? Depends on the utility. Yeah. On the utility. Well, right, but I mean, in in your control center here, you've got an operator who's monitoring those devices and switching those devices. So that's a lot of that's manual. But we fix those for our studies. Yeah. Yeah, you fix them in the studies. Yeah, I mean, when when you do a study, 
you you fix some stuff and you let some stuff change automatically. And it's like we've we've done projects for BPA where we've modified how our, our the taps and the switch shunts move to keep the generator reactive power within a limit, which is an operator response. So in PowerFlow, you've got some embedded operator responses that are considered to be so fast that we treat them as, in essence, algebraic constraints. In dynamic analysis, we're going to tend to remove most of that, and it will tend to be fixed because it's saying over 20, 30, 40 seconds, nobody's going to do anything with that. Okay, so the next couple of slides introduce the common models that we use for the different devices, transmission lines, transformers, generators, loads, and then we talk about assembling them. Uh, if we model the, uh, a transmission line on a very short time scale, say microseconds, then we'd use a full uh, incremental transmission line model. And this is a model, this would be a differential length of a transmission line. You say it's got some equivalent uh, a delta R value, a delta L value, and a delta shunt value associated with it. And you would set up the equations that model how the voltage and the current change as you go along the length of the lines. If we were doing uh, EMTP analysis where we were analyzing a line with a um, very short time scale, what we would see is that the prop propagation delays going down the line have to be considered. And then when you model the lines in more detail, you actually get some oscillatory behavior in a line. So this is a, a model that we simulated, not in Power World Simulator, but uh, we simulated it with a 100 microsecond time step. So this I did in a, in a class I was teaching just to show the students the impact of different models on the behavior of the system. And we just took a, a ideal voltage source, we had a switch that closed in, and then we watched how the waveform went down the line and it was just an RL wave there. Uh, because of the uh, short time step, we did get the delay caused by the propagation speed down the line. Because this was assumed to be a 100 mile line, and of course a 100 mile line is going to take uh, how long? 186 miles per millisecond. So if I'm doing 0.1 millisecond, there's going to be a delay. And if you look at the response when we close the switch, there's a little bit of delay there. Then you get the voltage overshoot on the far end and it oscillates down and eventually it goes into the waveform that we know and love. So the real behavior is going to have this voltage overshoot on it. That's something that we're going to ignore in the dynamics that we're talking about here. So in the dynamics that we talk about here, we're going to be assuming an algebraic relationship on our network models and we'll be using the um, standard per phase uh, lump parameter models that most of you know and love from the power flow. So in dynamics, we use a power flow model for the transmission line, which just represents it like that. So it's a lump series impedance and it's a lump uh, uh, shunt values. And that's the power flow model and that's what we use. Okay. Um, this model is only valid for transmission lines with symmetric tower configuration. Work one assumes the uni uniformly transposed lines. Uh, there's a picture of a line. Uh, there's a picture of uh, a, a line transposition. How much do you transpose your lines? I was talking to one guy, he was winning an award, and, and I was talking to him, and he was with a large utility, and he said, we have one point in our system where we transpose the line. So the, the theory is based on the fact that the lines are uniformly transposed. Whether a particular utility uniformly transposes their lines 
I don't know. I mean, some do better jobs than others. Uh, but you, you know, the the theory that this is all based on what occurs in practice is sometimes different. So there's going to be some difference in the results that you get. Uh, you know, the assumption is it. What we would say is it's good enough. It, it gets the job done. I mean, when we run these dynamic studies, yeah, there's uncertainty in them, but they're pretty good. I mean, that's the whole, the kind of the hope here. Um, so that's why we go through a per phase analysis of a, a three phase system. I, usually, I mean, what what we do in Power World is the standard modeling, which is saying we do positive sequence modeling. So when you're modeling in Power World, power world, you're doing a positive sequence model of a three-phase system that's going to have some imbalance in it, uh, but we assume the imbalance is not that large, so we're okay. Uh, that's the transformer models, oh. just a pretty standard transformer models. Uh, if you're interested in seeing uh, what happens when a transformer goes bad, have you guys seen this video before? Yeah, we show it in our undergrad classes. I put it on the, on the. Everybody got the slides, and on the slides there's Power World, Power World cases in there. I put the um, video in there if you want to see the video. I won't go through it right now, but it's uh, kind of interesting to show to the undergrads. Uh, per unit, uh, most everything we do is in per unit. So you're normalizing your values, taking your actual quantity and dividing it by a base value to get a per unit value. Uh, that's quite useful when you do analysis of systems that have a lot of transformers in them. Uh, for the generator models, like anything, the models depend upon the application. Uh, generator models are mostly synchronous machines. Uh, changing somewhat as we add more solar PV to the system and some wind turbines, but they're mostly synchronous machines. Um, in generator modeling, in the power flow, you use a steady state model where you tend to treat it as either, usually it's treated as a PV bus and you're trying to keep the, volt, the voltage magnitude is fixed and the reactive power output varies within limits. And then we're going to talk in the next section, which Jamie's going to do, about much more detailed uh, models uh, that we use for the generators and dynamics. Uh, load models, ultimate goal is to supply the loads with electricity at constant frequency and voltage. Lots of different things that go into the load models. Of course, in analysis, we don't represent every load. We do aggregate modeling. Um, in power flow, you tend to treat the load as constant power. Uh, if you don't treat it as constant power, you'll use a zip model where, of course, a zip model says part of it's constant P and part of it's constant current, part of it's constant power. Uh, you, of course, get the dynamic variation in load modeling. Uh, that graph there shows the variation of the load over a course of a year. Uh, the, uh, the graph on the left. The graph on the right shows the load variation over the course of a day with different components of the load. Uh, had to show the duck curve there, um, which is that uh, impacting you guys? Yeah, we're we're setting up simulations at A and M where we put the students in there and we we show them a grid and they tend to be operating a 2,000 bus grid. And we want to give them experience with operating the grid. So we're going to start simulating some of these conditions to give students a feel for what is it actually like to operate the grid over different conditions. Uh, if you haven't seen the duck curve before, it was produced by the California ISO a few years back now, where it shows the variation in their load over uh, the course of a day and in 20 Prior to 2012, they had the kind of the traditional peak in their load occurring mid midday, and then later on, as they get more solar PV, their net load is going down. And what happens is, as the sun starts to set, they get this rapid growth in the load. Uh, somebody called it. Somebody looked at it and said, "That looks like a duck." I have no idea why they. 
profile. Yeah, okay. Profile. This is the body, that's the head, <laughs> that's the tail. <laughs> All right. In uh, Texas, we have the armadillo curve. <laughs> I just saw an armadillo, actually, a live armadillo for the first time in the wild on Sunday <laughs> out hiking. But yeah, that, that's why they call it the duck. It doesn't look like a duck. Oh, come on. Use your, you got to use your imagination. <laughs> Someone needs to draw it in. Well, people do draw it in. Just put an eye right there and put some feathers on the back right. and add a few legs and you'll be good to go. All right. <laughs> I, you know, I tried to find an updated duck curve because this is this was like made a while back, you know, and we're currently in 2020, so we're at the bottom of the duck supposedly. Yeah, it looks it looks about right. You can go to the ISO website and they actually publish you know, the daily curves. Yeah. yeah, but they don't make it look like a duck. Well, that doesn't make it. Does. Yeah, whatever. I, I think the takeaway is if you want a graph to get noticed, you have to give it a good name. <laughs> if nobody had named that the duck curve, probably it would not have gotten the PR that it has. Um, the next few slides here uh, go through symmetrical components. Um, I'm going to go through these pretty quick. Uh, the, the gist is, in dynamics, we analyze the grid subject to disturbances, and the most common fault on a system tends to be a single line to ground fault. And when you study a, a power system using a positive sequence model, that's assuming balanced three-phase operation, uh, you could say, well, normally we're in balanced three-phase operation, but we're in much less in balanced three-phase operations when we put a single line to ground fault on, because that's unbalancing the system. So if we wanted to fully represent the system, uh, what we could do is we could either set up a full three-phase representation for the system, or we could use an approach known as symmetrical components. Uh, the key idea of symmetrical components is, is you can decompose a three-phase system into three sequence networks, and then these networks get coupled only at the point of imbalance. And uh, this is an idea that actually goes back to a paper from 1918. Uh, this was actually voted uh, by the people going to the North American Power Symposium in 2000 as the most important paper of the 20th century for power. Uh, the idea is we can decompose our system into a positive sequence, negative, and zero sequence. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on it here because in simulator, in dynamics, we mostly just do a positive sequence representation. You can represent a negative sequence system and a zero sequence system in simulator. And we've got code to do that, and we put it in for a project that we were doing with an overseas company about 10 years back. Um, I don't think it's very used, right? Are you talking about the transient stability? Yeah, we've got that right. in there. Yeah, it's in there. It's not used by default because what I have found is this audience never does that. They're just well, right. they're just given the model a single phase fall here. Stick this impedance in the default. That's that's their implication. Yeah. So we we there's a, a compensation method that you can use for a single phase fault, and it works pretty well. Uh, if we ever wanted to go to full three phase, and I'm not advocating this because it would take a lot of work to create these models and keep them up to date, uh, but we could. And these slides here, which I'll just jump through, talk about how you can use symmetrical components to represent uh, your system. Okay, but the way we will simulate a single line to ground fault is we'll use a positive sequence representation and just use compensation, and it's not a bad way to go. Okay. Okay. Um, any questions so far on anything? Now we're getting into dynamics, powerful and dynamics. Uh, to uh, do this, or to, we now have the models that we need. Um, when you do a dynamic study, what you start from is a power flow solution. The power flow solution initializes 
the dynamic study. And then what we do is we do a, a back solution from the power flow to figure out what the initial dynamic states in the system are. So the most common technique for solving the power flow is to use a newton raphson algorithm. That, that's what we do in the power flow solution. Uh, these are the power balance equations. Um, everybody's got a simulator here, right? Okay, so I, I did just want to show you how to go from a power flow to a dynamic study. Usually you're going to be given a save case and you're going to start from there, but I, I did want to show a, a quick example of how to go from taking a power flow and making it dynamic. So if you open up this 37 bus case, and I put the, um, and we're going to have lots of hands-on as we go through the course. Um, this is a case that we use for teaching our students at Texas A&M. Uh, because they're all Texas A&M students, we named it Aggie Land Power and Light. Uh, you can name it whatever you want. If you want to change it to WSU Power and Light, that's fine. Uh, other universities, I think, if, if they want to use this and change the bus names around, uh, more power to them. So, that, that's a power flow model. And of course, being a power flow model, uh, you know, if you set it simulating power world, you can click on a breaker and you see the change in the flows on the system as a result of opening up a line. Okay. Has everybody got that? Where did that come? Is that, uh, it must have come with an email. Ashley would, would have sent you an email yesterday uh, with a <coughs> file to download. All right. I didn't get it to her until Sunday. So. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> Power rules. Uh, yeah, it's uh, in. That's there is. Presentation one. Yeah, there was, there's a power world, there's a directory that has the, um, yeah, I mean, the, what you would have got from Ashley was, uh, here, go to this place and download a zip file, and the contents of that zip file is what's in the folder, Tom's right now. Yeah, I mean, I, if you can get it later, too, it's, yeah, no, it's fine. I found it. I just uh, yeah, they're under the Power World cases, and then I put all the cases that I'm going to use. Hopefully, Jamie, are you going to do any cases? Okay. Uh, Richard, I guess I am. You, okay. I just have them on my. I think we. I think we're going to use the 2000 bus, which I think is in that folder, right, Jamie? What was that? The 2000 bus case. They have yeah, that's in that. there too. Yeah. Okay, so I, I put mine in, in the talks. This is talk one overview. And the starting point is the 37 bus AGL, 37 bus power flow, and that, that's the case that I opened up here. And that's just a power flow model. So in introducing dynamics, um, when you solve a power flow, you've got this bus that we call the slack bus or the reference bus. Uh, the issue in the power flow is because it's a static analysis tool, we cannot arbitrarily specify the um, net power injections at every bus. So you have to have one location in the system that makes up the slack or makes up the balance to satisfy the fact that total generation must be equal to total load plus losses, this is the slack bus. The slack bus also provides an angle reference bus. Uh, when you solve a positive sequence power flow, you get a voltage magnitude and an angle. That angle is always with respect to some place. You can't arbitrarily specify an angle on an AC waveform. You have to have a, some sort of reference point. It has to be with respect to something. So that angle is provided by the reference bus. 
usually say the slack bus or the reference bus has an angle of zero. Uh, the bus has a fixed voltage magnitude. When you solve the power flow equations, you're varying the real and reactive power output of the bus to maintain that fixed voltage uh, value. This is not something that we need in dynamic simulations, though we still need an angle reference. And this will come up through the solutions because we're going to show you variation in a phase angle, and you always have to say variation with respect to what. And in dynamics, we uh, have different options for where we define our center of reference for the angle. There's different ways to do it, and we'll talk about how to do that. So in the power, you've got the um, PV bus, the PQ bus, and the slack bus. Those won't, the dynamics, we won't have a slack and we won't have PV buses. In power flow, when you change the output of a generator, um, that output, unless you do something else, like put your area on control, that change in the output of the generator is going to be absorbed by the slack bus. If you were to go into the power world simulator, which you could do right now, and I've, I've got it set up so that I've got click next to the output of the generation. If I click on one of these, uh, you know, maybe I click on this one up by five megawatts, a change here is immediately reflected by a change in the slack bus. And that's because of how things are modeled with the algebraic constraints, and the slack bus is gonna pick up the difference. And of course, in a large power flow, like you do it here in the West, is you'll have different areas and you might have your area on uh, participation factor control or something where when you change a transfer, uh, you have assumptions how that change in transfer is picked up at the different generators. Those, those assumptions have to be there. We go into dynamics. What we're going to do is we're going to move from a power flow where you have an equilibrium point. You open open a line or change a generation, you go to a different equilibrium point. Now we're going to look at what is the behavior of the system during that disturbance time period. And in particular, we're going to look and say, does the system have a stable response or does it have an unstable response during those time periods? The power flow is solving a set of algebraic equations. As we get into dynamics, what we're going to do is we're going to switch from having just a set of algebraic equations to having a set of algebraic and differential equations. So we're going to start in steady state, hopefully return to steady state, and represent dynamics in it. Um, this is the different terms that are typically used in talking about power system stability. Uh, this comes from a paper from 2004 that tried to provide a definition for the different terms for stability. Why I don't like power world trans instability designation, which ultimately I named initially, is because it just tends to be one part of stability according to this definition. And actually what we call trans instability covers all aspects of it. You can do the shorter term rotor angle stability, can do frequency stability and you can do voltage stability. So we might be modifying it more towards dynamics because it's really just looking at the dynamics of the system. So if we want to change our system over from being a power flow to a dynamic simulation, there's a couple things that we have to do. The first thing you have to do, well, you can do them in any order, but a good place to start is to set up dynamic models for your devices. Okay. Um, in, power, in, in a regular study, you're just going to load up some dynamic file. If it's a PSSE file, it will be a, a star.dy file, file. Um, 
You're going to load up a file that has the dynamics in them. Power World will store all these in the PWP format. But you could also set them up manually, and that's what we're going to do right now. So in the power flow, if we just go to one of the buses in the system, uh, say Cal 138, which is in the middle of the system, if you right click on it, you can get the generator information dialog. And from there, you can add some dynamic models. So if we go here, uh, I'm going to pause the simulation. And Kyle is right in the middle. Um, that's not named after our Kyle from Power World. It's a location on Texas A&M. But if you right click on this, and you look at the generator information dialog, uh, there's a whole bunch of tabs. For stability, we added another tab, which is over on the far right. Right now, there's no models defined. So to set up a dynamic simulation, we need to put in some dynamic models. If this is a, a, a generator, which or a synchronous generator, we would insert a synchronous machine model. So you just go to the machine models tab, Click insert, and there you get a, a growing list of different models that you can uh, use to represent the behavior of your device. If we were doing this 20 years ago, it might be a very short list. You know, you might have Gen, Gen CLS, you might have Gen RU, you might have Gen Sal in there. Over the years, this has expanded more and more, particularly as we're adding in more wind units. Um, just pick Gen RU, which is a generic, pretty good model for a, a round rotor generator. A click OK gives you a whole bunch of default parameters. Just click OK on the default parameters. And what we did is we just added a dynamic uh, model to represent the behavior of the machine itself. And then the um, I guess in the slides I used a Gen CLS. Uh, you can use a Gen CLS if you want. Gen CLS is a classical machine model. It's a simpler model. It doesn't matter for this demo. You can pick either one. So then most of the Power World Simulator dynamics functionality is asked is access from the transient stability analysis form. This is on the add-ons transient stability. So once you set up your dynamic model, then you go to add-on transient stability right there. And that brings up uh, this form here. Amy and I always have a debate as to whether this form should be a topmost form. <laughs> it doesn't always win the debate. No. Um, whatever you're working on. Right. And over time, I've had to see this is where I Nothing gets to yeah, when I when I work on this form, I like to have it on top. So if you want it on top, you click on the little Power World icon up here, and you can if you click on that little icon right there, you can get it to be free floating on top. If you like your windows to be free, yeah, I mean you should do that. The problem is put it on. So it, it, it's, it's an option. <laughs> Honestly, it doesn't make a lot of difference when you're presenting on a laptop, but if you've got a dual monitor system, I like to put it on top. Okay. Um, the transient stability form, which whether you have it on top or not, we're, we're gonna be talking through some of the various options that are available here. And the main one is the simulation. This is the simulation page where 
you control the simulation and you define events. The next one are various options. Then you specify what to store. We'll talk later on about plots. Uh, if you're a power world old hand, you might look and say results analyzer. Where did that come from? Uh, you would not have that because that's in the 22 beta. That's where we're trying to add in some more automatic analysis of results. Our results from RAM lets you look at the results in the RAM. Transient limit monitor, Jamie will talk about manual control, we'll talk about later validation, the eigenvalues modal analysis, and the rest. We're going to kind of start out at the top here to give you the uh, basics of how to do it. So if you want to do a dynamic study, uh, you have to define some models, you have to define an event, and you have to define what you want to see. And then you run it. So then keeping with the slides here, uh, this is the form there. Um, before doing anything, I, I do want to mention the concept of an infinite bus modeling. And In the part, we've got a slack bus, and the slack bus makes up the slack. In dynamics, we don't tend to have a slack bus, but you can set up something known as an infinite bus. Uh, an infinite bus is a location in the system that's assumed to have a fixed voltage, magnitude, angle, and nominal frequency. It's a bus location, a generator that's so big, nothing affects it. It makes its own voltage magnitude, angle, and frequency. These things don't really exist, but they can be a useful fiction. So we provide the ability to do infinite bus modeling. Uh, you can either set it as a fixed infinite bus, which is where we will start from. Later on, we'll show how you can play in different dynamics into this location and kind of uh, test your system under different conditions. So, the idea of an infinite bus is a good concept as long as you keep in mind that they don't really exist. Okay, but they're a good place to start. For this first example, we're going to use the option to treat the Slack bus as an infinite bus. So, to do that, if you go to options, right, which is the next one down, there's a whole bunch of different options. If you go to the power system model there, which is its options, it's the second one over. Here is infinite bus modeling right in the middle. There's an option by default, no infinite buses. That will tend to be the default unless you have a really little case. We're gonna set it up to model the powerful slack bus as an infinite bus. So if you just click that, then what it's saying is treat the power flow slack, which in this case is the generator up in the upper right, as an infinite bus. So it'll have a fixed voltage, magnitude, angle, and frequency. So just do that. Okay. We did that. Now we need to specify a contingency to specify the contingency, go back to the simulation page and click on the insert element button. This displays the um, transient stability contingency element dialog, which is used to specify events. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to put in an event where a fault on the line between buses 17 and 18 is cleared after two seconds by opening the line. Go back to the simulation. You guys have that already specified? I make it too easy for it. Um, if you want to start from scratch, you can just delete it. It doesn't matter where you put the fault and you just have to put some fault in, in the system here. In fact, I don't even think I've got the right fault in there. The way you insert a contingency is um, 
but if, if you want to delete them, you just select them and then you right click and you click delete and it would delete the elements. Okay. If you then, so if you want to insert them, you just click the insert button up here, brings up this dialogue. This dialogue is where you specify and say what is going to occur during this contingency, during this event. Uh, if I wanted to do something with the line, I spent, or Whatever object, I specify the object type, then I specify which particular object is it applying to, when does it apply, and what am I doing? So in this case, we're putting in a fault on a line, and I think in the slides I said it was between 17 and 18. So I pick branch line, I click 17, even a 17? A typo. What is it? Oh, 37. Yeah, okay. That's a typo. 37. And then you pick one of the circuits to 18 there. Uh, time t equals one. A lot of times when you're doing a dynamic simulation, you can start it at initial time t equals zero but it's useful to run the simulation for a little bit of time just to show that you've got an initial steady state solution. So we tend to apply contingencies after a second or two. So we'll apply it at time t equals one. Uh, you specify what type of event for line we can apply a fault, what type of fault it's a balanced three phase. And let's say it occurs 50% down the line. So the percent location here is 50%. Then you click uh, OK, and that contingency is in. And then we're going to add another event. So I'm going to go here and click Insert. And we're going to take that same line, 18 or 39, 37, here. And we're going to open that line. We want to open both ends and say we'll open it at um, 1.2 seconds. That was 1.2. And then we click OK, and we've got our second event in here. Um, one thing that we just did just like two days ago is this was designed to deal with a handful of events. Like how many events would you put in here? 10, 15, 20. So my students gave me a case where they had 24,000 events to follow. And I'm burying the load. <laughs> and it wasn't designed for that. And what happened is if you right click on here and you do show dialogue, we have this little nice box up here that gives a description of the fault and it's a drop down box. So if you drop it down, you can look at all the other events that have been set up and you can scroll through it and things like that. Um, that takes time to fill that drop down. If you thought, you know, 10, 20, 30, 100 events, it doesn't take much time. 24,000 events, it takes time. So um, we just modified that for version 22. If you have more than, say, 500 events defined, you don't get the drop down box, you just get an edit box. Look at the arrows, which hopefully you'll never experience. But it's good to know that if you, defy, if you decide to define 24,000 events, we are now supporting that. <laughs> you could say it's supported. It just yeah. Yeah, and then uh, the next thing is you're gonna we're gonna do a time simulation. What do you want to see? What do you want to say? And there's a lot of different options for what you want to save. Uh, the result storage button right here, which is 
on the menu over here, simulation options and results stored. This allows you to specify what you want to see. And depending upon a different kind of philosophies, I mean, some people want to see everything all the time. So they want to store everything all the time. Uh -huh. The page, yeah. You always get a my page Basically, this dialogue is there's always an option. Yeah. And so by default, I'm like, and it's never gotten wrong. There's just low hits. Yeah, I mean, because every this these are events and contingency, and the contingency always has a name. Plus, Okay, so in the result storage, what you use this for is to specify what you want to store. And there's lots of options for what you want to store. Um, and that depends on how you're doing the simulation. Are you doing it where you want to kind of interact with it immediately, or do, are you doing it more in batch where you want to store it off the hard drive? For right now, we'll just use the, um, the tabular display here where we're going to say for the generator, if you just click on the save all here, it will save all of the fields uh, for that generator. Or all, all, all the fields for the generators. Then this field here says how often do you want to save the results. In transient stability or dynamics, you're running a time domain simulation using an integration time step. Uh, the integration time step is typically half a cycle or a quarter cycle. Do you want to see if it's a half cycle? Do you want to see all 120 values per second? Maybe you do. If you do, then you just set this to one. But maybe you just want to see it at PMU frequency, which would be 30 times per second, then you would set it to four. It's just a question of how much data you want to have to deal with. Okay, so we'll just leave it at one here. Yeah, I mean, it, it's... You, it, yeah, there is. There's lots of different issues with this. The, the gist is you're running a dynamic simulation, you're sampling and looking at it, and how often do you want to look at it? And um, some people like to use an odd value there. And we, we typically will, I mean, it depends what we want to do, but a lot of times we'll set it to 12 if we're running uh, 240 times per second, so we get 20, but it, it's up to you. Uh, okay, so we specify what we want to do. Then, if you go to the simulation page, uh, you're starting at some time, which is practically always zero. You're running for so many seconds, and you're picking an integration time step, which can be specified either in seconds or cycles. Usually, it's specified in cycles. So, pick uh, you can use 0.5 or 
uh, 0.25. If you put that smaller, it can take longer to run, get more data, but you can avoid numerical instability issues. So here we'll just use a quarter or I mean a half cycle. Then you just click the run transit stability and it runs the simulation. Now I defined the plot. Okay. Did everybody get a plot that popped up? Everybody saw a plot? I Okay, depends on what case you entered up. Right. You can define plots, and we'll talk about defining plots later on. If you had not defined a plot, if you go to results storage, uh, results, not results storage, results from RAM, this shows you the raw data of what you just ran for the different field. And over here, if you store a whole bunch of fields, this provides a quick way to filter which fields you want to see in your result. What I will tend to do is I will tend to uncheck all of these and then just check the one that I'm interested in. So let's say I want to see the rotor angle. This shows me the rotor angle on all the generators in the case. And in particular, this last one. Are you guys seeing header names here? The actual names of them? Yeah, you're seeing that. It's like I got to load a file. I don't have a file in the right directory here. I'll fix that. One yeah, you go to play options. Oh, it says options. Drop down. Right. Oh. Where is that? Right down. Oh, up, down, up, right there, nearby, nearby, just to the right, a little bit, down, a little bit. There you go. Oh, see where it says option? Is that a variable name? Oh, you messed up my computer. I never changed this. I'm always normal. Okay. I've never changed that. I didn't even know that existed. Yeah, if you feel like Power World's got a lot of functionality and you don't know it all, it's like, yeah, same here. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not Mr. Oxfam. Um, I, I will say, though, we, we are giving a class on Power World automation using Python at Texas A&M in, I think, March. And that's a class, it's a repeat of a class that we gave last fall that was really popular. And then uh, later on, Power World did it at California ISO. So if you're interested in Power, Power World automation using aux files in Python, you might want to sign up for that class. Um, but I, I teach in that class, but I don't teach a lot of it. Okay, so if you want to do a quick plot of this result, if you right click on the column and you do plot column, you get like a quick plot of the result. And the details of what's going on are not important right now, but the takeaway is what we did is we went from a static power flow to a dynamic analysis and we just added one dynamic model to the system. We specified an event, which was a line fall and then we specified a bunch of data to solve. We did a simulation time, which in this case, 10 seconds, and we got some dynamic results. Okay, is there any questions on that? Just don't want to go to the Yeah, and we're almost done here. Uh, I talked about quickly plotting the results, uh, more realistic generator. Uh, Jamie's gonna talk about that very soon. Uh, that's the GenRU, which we'll talk about. 
Uh, there's lots of ways in simulator to get access to data. And if you say, uh, how do I look at like the results on all of my generators? Uh, there's lots of ways to do that that we talk about later on in the course. Um, if you want to know In this, this one here, I set up models for all the generators so I get much more dynamic response, and that's in that directory as well. A thing that you sometimes want to do on these simulations is to say, how long should that, or how long can that line be faulted before the system loses synchronism? And you can look at the critical clearing time on that by just playing around with uh, different uh, values. There's also a critical clearing calculator down there. And that's it. Any questions? Hopefully this got uh, a little bit of intro and now we're going to dive into a lot more detail. So we're taking a break. <laughs>